Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we now slowly get into the closure of this course and uh, this is the last segment of the course. Uh, we have done uh, or covered lot of topics in steel making uh, starting with uh, an overview of steel making, the science based fundamentals, description of primary and secondary steel making processes, casting processes, modeling. So we have now a fairly good idea of the subject of steel making and with lot of supplemental problems, uh, which you can concurrently solve uh, with this course or the course material as the background material, uh, course content as the background material, uh, you should be equipped to handle uh, many challenging problems on the shop floor as well as from the viewpoints of design uh, and process analysis. Now, having said so much about the subject of steel making, perhaps uh, the concluding lecture must give you, uh, I would not say lecture, but maybe lectures uh, must give you some information uh, regarding the state of iron and steel making in India. Uh, it is for us now to review that uh, how the subject or uh, the industry has grown in this country, uh, how the what future stores for us uh, and uh, what are our problems, uh, how can you address and I think that the teaching of the subject is not going to be complete unless really uh, we, we give you some background in the uh, you know, history of modern day iron and steel making in India. And you must remember that uh, you know, since independence, this is the first or the foremost heavy industrial sector. And uh, today, uh, we are an extremely proud nation as far as steel making is concerned. Uh, producing nearly about uh, 55 million tons in the year of 2009 through prime, primary and secondary processing roles. So, many terminologies that I am going to use here, you are already accustomed, or you already know those terminologies. So, it will be easier for you to grasp when I say that secondary steel producer, you know electric furnace steel producer. So, you know that I am referring to uh, mini steel plants or mini steel sectors, uh, which basically uses electric car part and continuous casting today. Now, the history of iron and steel making in this country is extremely old. Uh, I think there is indication that uh, you know it goes back as far as th the third millennia. Uh, now, you mo most of you have seen or heard about the iron pillar. We have a very rich history of iron and steel making. Make, I mean, you go to the Mohenjo-daro Mohan civilization even it is documented that when Alexander the Great came to India, his soldiers needed to reinforce their arrowheads and it is the Indian you know, uh, localized steel makers, they helped uh, you know, Alexander and his troop uh, and provided them with the necessary armaments. So, we are not interested in that history. Uh, there are many excellent uh, resource material available on the subject of the history of iron and still in this country. Professor Ranganathan of IIC Bangalore has uh, written uh, textbooks with Sharda Srinivasan uh, and there are compilations uh, by the Ministry of Steel as well as the Joint Planning Committee which traces. Uh, Tata Steel also has some compilations and if you come across this which are there in archives today, uh, you should get a fairly good idea of iron and steel making. Uh, you know, in the prehistoric uh, time, 1000, 2000, 3000 years back and so on. Now, coming back to the modern India, I mean referring from the date in the times of the British Raj, uh, I would say that uh, the first notable attempt was actually done uh, you know, on large scale production of iron, particularly pig, pig iron uh, by a foreign national uh, who tried to do it. Uh, on a very small scale basis, about 40 tons uh, a week, that is the rate of pig iron production somewhere down the coast of south. 
and uh, his name is name is uh, Joshua uh, Heth, uh, but somehow uh, the quality of steel uh, pig iron produced was so inferior um, that uh, with the competitions uh, that were there in the market, the fellow could not compete, and soon his facility was shut down. So that this happened somewhere around 1830 along the coast of Madras. Now, after that, around 1874 or so, uh, this uh, Bengal Iron Works, it started functioning, Bengal Iron Works. So, that is about 1874 and where it started uh, near the vicinity uh, of uh, Asansol, Kulti, Banpur area. Uh, but soon, uh, the iron company faced some problem and it was taken over in 1889, uh, I think, yes, in 1889 uh, by the Bengal Iron and Steel Company and it was still called BIW, but this time the Borakar Iron Works. Ultimately, so this, this takeover, the, the closure of the Bengal Iron Works and the formation of uh, the Borakar Iron Works or renaming of the Barak Bengal Iron Works as the Barakar Iron Works. This is Barakar Iron Works and this is Bengal Iron Works. So, this is this was under the ages of the Bengal Iron and Steel Company and then ultimately in that locality uh, somewhere around 1937 or so, uh, you know, the Isko Banpur factory also came. So, how much uh, of uh, iron was produced? Somewhere, somewhere around 40,000, that was the rated uh, capacity, 40,000 tons. This is 1,000 kg uh, metric tons, uh, metric tons of iron. So, that was around the beginning of the 19th century and then the end of the 19th century and then uh, the regulator day in the history of iron and steel making came and which is August 27th, uh, 2007, when TISCO was launched at Jamshedpur. Of course, at that time Jamshedpur was known as Sakchi uh, and Jain Tata started, Jamshed Jain Auruji Tata started the TISCO factory. Uh, and with a rated capacity of 120,000 iron and steel. So, it is a finished steel production and the first product rolled out sometimes around December 2008. That is the time when Tisco produced uh, the first steel and uh, in the beginning of this is 1907 actually, I am sorry, yes. so this is 1908. So, Tisco actually recently uh, celebrated their centenary, if most of you are aware of this. So, around 1917, 1923, 1907, around that, we had three different uh, sectors where a uh, iron and steel was produced, ISCO and then 1917 that is the ISCO and this is the Vadrabuti Iron and Steel Company in South India. So, that was the scenario uh, in the post independent you know about 40, 30, 40 years uh, before the independence and these were the three companies which were mostly rolling out steel. So, actually the, the, the Howrah bridge, the old Howrah bridge now over the Ganges uh, near Calcutta, we have several bridges, but the oldest one which connects actually the Calcutta city, uh, which is a cantilever bridge actually. So, it is a suspension bridge on both the ends, there is no pillar at all uh, in between and that the steel for that bridge actually. So, it is a symbol of national pride actually that 
you know long long time back around 1930s or so, uh, we could produce steel and the, this uh, Howrah bridge today stands at you know long 80 years and we must be very proud of our extremely old uh, heritage. Now, following independence, uh, the steel sector uh, started to grow, because Nehruji really uh, envisioned uh, you know that we have to develop and a developing society uh, without steel perhaps uh, cannot sustain. I mean you see everywhere, uh, I have mentioned also that the consumption of steel is an index of the prosperity of the society consumption of flat products uh, is uh, really an index of the welfare uh, of the society, how good the people are living, uh, you know, what are their gross income and so on. These are indication. The standard of living, I mean, steel consumption standard of living, flat product consumption standard of living, these are all synonymous terms. So, before, after independence, uh, the steel production sector grew remarkably. So, somewhere around uh, you know, 1920 or so, when we were producing, uh, you know, say I would say 1947, Tisco was rolling out around 1 million tons of steel per annum. That was the production. So, couple of million tons, a few million tons around the time of independence, and today, uh, where we stand, we stand at 55 million tons. And that is the steel production uh, in 2009. And if you look at the figures, it goes like something like I would go 32, maybe 38, maybe 44, 55. So, this is the figure at 2009, and these figures are all in million tons. This is the figure in 2006, this is the figure in 2005, and this is the figure in 2003. Steadily, but even if you take one important thing here is, if you take this 55, these are all in million tons, million metric We are steadily growing. Now, the Projection says that by 2012, this is the Ministry of Steel's projection, we are going to produce around 100 million tons of steel or 110 million tons of steel, and by 2020, we are talking about 180 million tons. So, that is, so these are all projections. These are the real data, and on the right, 212 and 200 to 2020 are the projections. Now, in 2008, roughly 1308 million tons of steel was produced globally. This is the global steel production, and I have mentioned at one point of time that steel production in the last 50 years. Uh, you know, has surged from 200 million tons. Uh, now today is 13.8, so which is about sixfold higher. Uh, population is increasing. Uh, the society needs steel for development. We have to make bridges. We have to make roads. We have to, uh, you know, build houses, infrastructures, and so on. And everywhere we need steel. So uh, the society is really hungry for steel, and that's why, you know, we see this trend also globally. Uh, and it is a mere reflection in the, in the country also that the production of steel is going to increase continuously up to 220 million tons. And after, here the share of India was roughly about 50 million tons. On the other hand, China was producing about 400 million tons, significantly larger. Today, if you look at the Asian countries, more than 50 percent or around 50 percent of the world steel is produced in the Asia itself by countries like China, uh, Japan, Korea and India. These are the four major uh, steel producers in the Asian countries. And if you sum up all their rated capacities, I mean how much they produce, you will find that it turns out to be almost 45 to 50 percent of the global steel action. 
we are going to examine this, you know, in order to achieve these targets, what we have to do, where we stand right now, what are our problems. Uh, if you have traveled up to this far, how difficult it is going to be for us to go to 180 billion ton, does it look too rosy or really we are capable of doing it and that we are going to examine in this uh, concluding lectures. Now, one important aspect here is, if you take 55 billion tons and India's population, if you set it 1.1 billion, right? that is the population of India. So, it turns out that 55 kg is the per capita steel consumption, 55 kg of steel per person, person and this is per year, which is called the per capita steel consumption of the nation. Although this figure is an average one, there is a quite a drastic range of the value and someone estimated that in the villages of India, per capita steel consumption could be as low as 2 to 5 kg. For example, imagine in my house, I have lot of gadgets, I have a car, the fans are there, electrical equipments are there in my houses, okay, which are made out of steel. So, I consume lot of steel, so, I have a lawn mower that is made out of steel, I have a car that is made out of steel, fans, air conditioners, fridge, everything is made out of steel. Go to a villager, a village hutment and if you see that steel, perhaps only the utensils are steel and that is what you see that the villagers or the villages in India on a per capita basis do not consume much steel also. If you look around the huts, there is no uh, steel in the uh, building, in the villages, these are hutments. If you go to the roads, there are no steel used in, in building, making the roads, there are all kacha roads. If you go to the village and look at the bridges over a little river or riverine, you will see that the bridges are made out of bamboo. Okay, or wood. So, virtually there is not much steel, but there is quite a bit of scope. Okay. We have to, you know, if the standard of life has to go up, the roads has to be laid properly, the bridges have to be built, truck bodies, we cannot afford to make the truck bodies out of uh, wood, you know, anymore. So, the truck bodies have to be made out of steel, so that we, we anticipate that as the prosperity, if you go by that slogan of Gramat Buddha, Dishad Buddha, you know, if the villagers upliftment of the villagers will necessarily see a surge in the requirement of steel uh, in the country, because you know, as the villagers increase their standard of living, they will demand for more steel and where from the steel is going to come? The steel is going to be rolled out from the factory and that is how the country has to produce more and more steel. So, the demands are justified. We have 1.1 billion people, we are consuming too little amount of steel uh, and as I said that well, this could be you know, 2 to 5 kg in the villages and while in the cities, it could be about some people maybe a few people may be consuming 200, 300 kg of steel and so on. So, the world average steel is, if you take the total, divide it 1308 million tons divided by the total population of the world, then you get the global average of per capita steel consumption, which comes out to be 120 kg per person per year. On the other hand, if you go to European nations and Americans, okay where every house may have one or two, two or three cars, you know a lot of steel structures, and the house is made out of steel, the kitchens made out of steel, furniture is made out of steel and there you can see that this value, you know in advanced countries could go as much as 300 to 300. Even if you think like, if you go up to the global average of 120 kg, you can imagine that 1.1 billion and maybe by 2020 we will be 1.3 billion. So, you know 180 from that point of view is even uh, less. Okay. So, if you have, uh, if you go up to 1.4 billion people, person, okay. so in that case we can see that if you go to 180, possibly we can get about 100 kg or 110 kg something like that, which will be pretty much close to the global average or so on. So, this is a reasonable you know, taking into account, the projection is not unrealistic, the projection is realistic, if you know the standard of living of the entire nation has to go up 180 is perhaps the value uh, 
where we should stick to around 2020 with a net population of about 1.3, 1.4 billion people. Now, how are steel made in this country? Okay, before independence, these are the three sectors. Now, we will examine everything in the perspective of the currently, uh, no, no, the current uh, domestic steel scenario. So, we have basically in the country um, primary producers, we call primary and secondary producers. That is where from our steel comes, secondary producers. Or we can say that, well, we have integrated steel mills from which steel comes. We have mini steel mills also from which steel is produced. So, mini mills are basically secondary producers, primary producers are basically primary, uh, you know, the integrated steel mills, and in secondary producers, we are talking about not only electric arc furnace, but we are talking about induction furnace steel making as well as electric furnace steel making. These furnaces are very small capacity furnaces. 2 to 5 tons furnaces. On the other hand, electric furnaces in, in, the, in this country, we have about 30 ton size is the maximum, 30, 30, 30 ton, 30, 35 ton size. Primary producers uses BOF vessel and we have converters in this country, which goes up to 320 ton size. Ladles also, I have mentioned to you, ladles and um, converters, they are of the equivalent capacity. So, ladle and ton dish, they both have about 300, that is Bokaro steel plant has about 320 ton size uh, LD converter. So, both primary and secondary steel producers uh, have been producing steel and interestingly, there is a unique feature of the Indian steel industry is that uh, till to th around 2006 or so, uh, the share of the primary producers to secondary producers was roughly about uh, you know 50 50. Uh, so, that is the kind of uh, production uh, you know say 20 million ton through primary producers, 20 million ton through the secondary production. We must understand that uh, this has also been reviewed uh, that the raw materials are basically different. When you talk of primary producers, we are talking of integrated steel mills, we are talking about blast furnaces which produces molten, mill, molten metal or molten pig iron. On the other hand, when you are talking about secondary producers, uh, secondary steel making, we are talking of induction furnace and EAF, there is no blast furnaces. Okay. So, therefore, the charge from which we are going to melt, uh, you know, make steel uh, cannot be solely uh, the scrap, because of the simple fact that our steel consumption is also not too large, that the society is going to generate too much of scrap. You go to US, you go to, um, for example, Europe, you see, you know, there are so much of scrap is generated because people are using car. Every third year they buy a new car. So, the old car becomes scrap. So, but in this country, because we consume less, we do not uh, produce much scrap. So, therefore, what are the basic materials from which the induction arc, induction furnace and arc furnace produces steel? It is basically the DRI, direct reduced iron. So, that is why since 50 percent of the steel or 45 percentage of the steel produced in this country are by through secondary routes, okay, uh, through induction furnace through EAF and that the induction and the EAF is based on the DRI. So, we must now understand that in the absence of scrap, when you use large tonnage of DRI, the country must be having adequate facilities for the production of DRI. And interestingly for you to note that we are the largest producer of DRI in the whole world. So, we are number 1 here. And what is our rank of steel producers? In 2009, we were the fifth steel producer along with China at the top, Russia, then we have uh, Japan, uh, then we have Brazil and then we have India. So, this is the fifth and we rank fifth in 2009, which is steadily going to increase, uh, increase uh, you know, improve uh, and as far as DRI is concerned, we are the first rank. How much of DRI we produced? Around 2006, we produced about 14 million tons of DRI. 
So, we are not very good in keeping statistics. So, these values that is why every time I write, I write with an approximate sign, which means it could be you know, 15 million, it could be 13.5 million and so on. So, this is a reasonable value that I am you know authentic value that I am trying to quote here, but 2009 the DRI production was somewhere around 21 million ton, 20 or 21 million ton. Now, we must and in the foreseeable future also, uh, we would uh, expect that in view of this growth, projected growth, the secondary steel producers are going to uh, stay there uh, and contribute immensely to the production, uh, domestic production of steel. Uh, why I am saying that? Because uh, when you are talking of primary producers, you cannot really produce uh, all the steel from here to here through the primary production uh, routes or the integrated steel mills. Because setting up an integrated steel mill requires huge amount of land. And today, as you all know, there is so much of dispute in the country about the acquisition of land. You have to have infrastructure. You have to have, you know, huge cranes, uh, huge, uh, you know, vehicles uh, or excavators, land excavators, in order to prepare, uh, you know, uh, the premises for the steel production. You require enormous amount of cash flow, uh, and you require large, you know, basis of vicinity in the you know, location in the vicinity of the raw materials, there are so many constraints. So, huge capital cost, you know, infrastructural facilities, land acquisition problems, uh, you know, investors and all this perhaps will not, uh, you know, allow the primary steel sector only be growing and contributing to 180 million ton. We will perhaps anticipate that, you know, we can anticipate here that simultaneously also the uh, secondary sector is going to grow because secondary sector as such uh, does not consume you know that much resources you can have electric arc furnace facility um, and in a very small premises capital expenditure is large, uh, small and so on but two important issues come here that when you are talking of secondary producers the secondary producers all rely on the source of electricity and most of them they are not doing that well uh, so that you know they can have their own captive plants. Most of these plants actually secondary producers, they depend on uh, electricity from the local state governments and that is why the cost of steel production, cost of uh, steel produced through secondary routes uh, tend to be enormously high. So, if the secondary steel sectors grow in this country, we must understand that the production of DRI has to further in increase and it is projected that by the time we hit here somewhere. Uh, we are talking about you know 2020 somewhere around 50 million tons. That is the kind of DRI uh, we have to uh, produce and also uh, the secondary sectors must tighten up their belt uh, in order to sort out the issues, spending issues with electricity generation uh, and so on. I am going to talk about the problems more uh, in a little, a little bit later. Now, if you look at this uh, you know, statistics and the primary versus the secondary producers, uh, we note that we have basically, because without talking about the raw material a little bit, uh, you know, it is, I cannot really go further and explain certain key issues. We have an excellent resource of iron ore in this country, if we are aware of this particular fact. And I think we have both the kinds of reserves like uh, uh, hematite and magnetite. And I think the hematite reserve goes somewhere like million tons and approximately magnetite reserve goes. And these are extremely high, uh, good quality iron ore, and the, we are talking about 65 percentage, 60 to 65 percentage iron. That is the level of iron we are talking about. And today, uh, you know, there are a lot of interest uh, on the part of the steel makers uh, to have their captive steel mines, uh, as far as uh, there are certain localities in India. Is one called uh, 
Chiriya mines uh, somewhere, uh, you know, Chhattisgarh uh, area, um, and uh, very high, very good quality iron ore, and a lot of interest is there on the part of the steel making companies uh, to take that on lease. But all through India, whether you talk of the Belari district in southern India or you talk of uh, uh, western India, which is uh, Bastar district and uh, close to uh, Jamshedpur area, that is the uh, Singhum district. We have excellent, you know, throughout the eastern India as well as uh, southern India and to some extent western India also, we have excellent resources, resource material as far as iron ore is concerned. We have some problem though, uh, because we are in this, we have silica, our ore is high silica, silica is almost about 2.5 percentage and we also have alumina, which is about 2.5 percentage. So, this is a problem with iron ore. What about coal or coke? The reserve of coke and coal runs in billions of tons. Uh, now, roughly we have say coking coal and non coking coal. And this is about 170 billion tons and this is about 40 billion tons. And out of this, 30 billion tons and 140 billion tons. This is inferior and this 30 billion tons possibly is good in terms of making direct reduced iron and so on. The issue really is these are estimates of reserves. Does that mean that we can take out each and every kg of coal uh, from the mines, no, they depend on the bed depth where they are located. Okay. So, the problem with Indian coal, uh, both coking and non coking is the high ash and that is why today you see there are a lot of coal washeries. Uh, you have plants which are based on the shore, which functions on the blending of the coal. So, we have our co coke, which is otherwise fine, but uh, contains lot of ash and this coal the coke is mixed with the imported coke, which has a relatively lower amount of coke ash and when you blend the two cokes, you get a resultant mixture, which has intermediate ash and which you charge into the blast furnace in order to have good production rate and coke consumption rate in the blast furnace itself. So, there is no dearth of material as far as this is concerned. Actually, so much of iron ore we have taken out in the last few years that the country does not have the means to produce steel and as a result of what happened is, we landed up to be a net exporter of iron ore and these are high value product. I mean, we should have been manufacturing iron and steel in our country rather than importing, you know, exporting uh, the raw material outside. We were, you know, one of the largest exporters of very high grade iron ore during 2007, 8 and 9, but I think the ministry is now, uh, the central government is now putting some kind of an embargo and discourage people. Now, that is why, I mean, the abundance of raw material, uh, you know, high quality raw material. Uh, okay, let me just talk about lime. We also have good quality lime or the fluxing material uh, available in the country, uh, but uh, so far as Indian lime, may, you know, is concerned, lime limestone is concerned, they tend to be little bit hygroscopic. So, that is why uh, that is the only demerit, but other than that, you know, as far as the silica is concerned, this is relatively less. The lime has 50 60 percentage of CAO, which is a very good quality, uh, you know, as far as the making uh, of iron and steel is concerned. Now, we have many players uh, which have uh, come to manufacture uh, iron and steel in the country. And after independence, uh, you know, both private and the public sector steel industries uh, have uh, grown remarkably. And today, uh, I think uh, roughly 66 percentage of Indian steel produced 
is through the private public sector, uh, sorry, private sector. And 34 percentage of steel is through public sector. In the public sector steel plants, we have, for example, sail plants, there are many such, and RINR, these are Rashtriya Ishpat Nigam Limited, that is the Vizag based steel plant, and that is what I said, Vizag steel plants, steel plant, it is shore based steel plants. So, why it is shore based? Because you know it uses blending of coke, coal. So, you, you import coal, then you blend it. So, if your plant is located close to the seashore, then importing and exporting the finished product becomes much more easier, transportation cost is minimal. Uh, Sail has very many plants starting with uh, Durgapur steel plant, Durgapur alloy steel plant, then you have Raukela steel plant, Bilai steel plant. And now, Bhadravati Iron and Steel Company, Salib Steel Plant. So, these are many uh, Bukaro Steel Plant. So, there are you know many of these uh, which are managed by the Steel Authority of India Limited, uh, which is headquartered in Delhi. This is private sector steel industry has grown remarkably over the years, and this private sector comprises the both the primary producer and the secondary producer. So, what are the key primary producers in the country? The key primary producers in the country are the Tata, Jindals, then Mittal. This is not by the way Mittal steel, this is the Ishpat group, uh, Pramodan Vinod Mittal, who has uh, works uh, near uh, Bombay, a place called Dalvi, uh, Dolvi. So, you have SR. And now, the projected is POSCO is going to come and POSCO is projecting 12 million tons plant, 12 million ton per annum plant and you are, you must be reading many a times in the newspaper, uh, you know, how difficult it is for POSCO to set up, you know, sort out the land issues, the mines issues and so on and so forth. Jindals have many steel plants. They have steel plants in uh, Belari district, which is uh, uh, Turangolu. They have steel plants uh, in Raigarh, uh, that is in Chhattisgarh. They have steel plants in uh, Hisar, which is a stainless steel company in that various places. Tata's have their works principal works in Jamshedpur, they are also looking for some expansion in the MP district and all. But today in Jamshedpur, Tata makes more steel than it used to do 10 years back. So, there is a you know, huge expansion program going on in Tata itself. So, the plant uh, that Jindals have uh, in Turangalu, it is initially started with 2 million tons, then it went up to 4 million tons and currently it is going producing 7 million tons uh, in one. Uh, single place. Uh, and so, this is the JSW plant I am talking about, Jindal Southwest in uh, Turangalu near Bellary. So, and this now produces 7 million tons, which is expected to go up to 10 million tons. In, and in the one single campus itself, they are producing about 10 million tons of will be producing 10 million tons of steel. JSW is thinking about setting up new projects also. So, this is a future project. These are all existing projects, huge capacity plants, 3 million ton, 4 million ton, 7 million ton, these are the rated capacities, several million tons per annum. Mittals are also the future player. This is the Ellen Mittal group, Arcelor Mittal group actually they are also planning to set up plants uh, somewhere in the Jharkhand district. So, the Jindals for example, as I have mentioned, Tata's are planning for expansion elsewhere also beyond Jamshedpur. Similarly, Jindals are also looking for expansion elsewhere. For example, I think 4 or 6 million tons of steel plant uh, has been envisaged by JSW 
at Shalboni in West Bengal. Similarly, in Angul, uh, JSPL General Steel and Power Limited, which is Raigad based, Raigad in Chhattisgarh, and this is the Navin Jindal owns this plant. So, they are planning for some uh, you know, um, additional uh, facility, new facility in Odisha Angul district. So, new projects are also coming up, and this new projects. There are altogether new players also. So, they, they, they are you know quite old timers as far as steel is concerned. SR is also has expanded their production capacity in Hazira works and they have also started making steel uh, somewhere uh, in Odisha also they have started their production. Apart from this, many steel plants, these are the old timers like as I have mentioned already. So, these are integrated steel producers, Ishpath Industries, Hospets Steel, Sunflag, SR, Jindal, Stainless Steel, JSW, JSPL, Tata and this is I am talking about the private sector and because we need more investment, more steel, new players have come, Bhushan Steel, Adhunik Steel, Sham, Balaji and so on. And these are basically, these either have small blast furnaces, mini blast furnaces or they have huge blast furnaces. Uh, and when you talk of mini blast furnaces, you must be knowing that mini blast furnaces are about 50 to 300 meter cube, that is the volume of mini blast furnaces. Uh, Hospital steel for example, they have a 350 uh, meter cube blast furnace and you have many secondary producers also, innumerable secondary producers. It is not possible to list all of them, I have listed some key players. So, Mukund is one, uh, Moscow, Mahindra Eugene Steel Company is one, Kalyani Carpenter Special Steel, Lloyds and there are uh, many other steel plants uh, which are based on electric furnace as well as these are the prominent players and they, they produce high quality uh, alloy steels uh, for automobile applications and for key engineering uh, applications. Now, one important aspect about the secondary steel producer production is that why it is that the arc furnace uh, steel making has not really grown in India. I mean if you look at the number of induction furnace facilities, they are roughly about 700. On the other hand, you have barely you know 30 to 40 electric arc furnaces in India. So, the secondary sector also that produces steel and in this country very interestingly uh, that most of it comes or a bulk you know a major chunk of it comes from uh, the induction furnaces where the number is really uh, enormous uh, and it is basically because setting up of an induction facility uh, is extremely inexpensive in comparison to an EAF uh, facility. Now, the electric arc furnace uh, in our countries are also age old, uh, you know uh, they, they, their sizes are small, what are the characteristics of EAF is EAFs in India for example, uh, it is a small size, very small size. When outside you know in advanced countries you can see about 400 ton size of electric arc furnaces in our country, the electric arc furnace size is small, barely about 30 uh, metric, metric tons, metric tons. Our electricity is a major problem. Well, this is a problem with induction furnace also. We have problems uh, with uh, technology. These furnaces are age old furnaces. For example, if you go to Moscow and if you see their electric uh, arc furnace, a very, very old furnace actually 30, 40 years old furnace with not much process control, with not many sensors. Uh, and finally, when we are talking of you know we have uh, low efficiency transformers, the transformers are also not good which cannot feed in really uh, low efficiency transformers. So, the tap to tap time is really high because you require melting uh, you know and refining uh, today still you know if you go electric arc furnace steel making uh, they are making life of integrated steel makers uh, miserable in terms of you know providing the right kind of competition because so many developments have taken place in electric arc furnaces which you may have done starting from cojet technology submerged gas injection you know uh, fume hood analysis good process control uh, good end carbon determination and on every front uh, electric arc furnace has undergone revolution and uh, you know 
as far as steel making is concerned. But when you look at the steel making, EIF steel making facilities in India, uh, you become really sad uh, to know the state of things. And that is why, you know, uh, the steel produced uh, by uh, electric arc furnaces uh, is, uh, is not significant in this country. No new facilities have been erected in recent years, uh, because we do have problem, you know, national, nationally, uh, on, we do have problem as far as electricity is concerned. So, nobody wants to, uh, you know, invest money in electric arc furnace. So, whatever is the we are maintaining sort of a status quo, the old EAFs are continuing, the old EAFs are again not that good and that is why the rate of production is small, you know, very, very uh, low and that is why, you know, people found out that why, why invest money here? Invest money in induction furnace and uh, which is very, you know, which consumes less amount of uh, you know, small resources and yet you can uh, make lot of steel uh, and that is why you see a proliferation in the induction uh, furnace uh, facilities. So, also one important aspect is that when you produce DRIs, you produce DRI fines uh, and people have found that in induction furnace, those DRI fines, we are talking about 3 millimeter size. These DRI fines cannot be really charged into the EAF, because from the electrodes, you know, when you have uh, when you strike the arc, what happens there is going to be tremendous amount of, uh, you know, splashing and fume gas evolution and so on. So, if you, if you tend to add the DRI in a continuous mode into the EAF during, as you, as you, as you arc, what is going to happen is lot of the DRI is going to be driven out. So, the induction furnace on the other hand can accommodate these fines, uh, fine DRIs very effectively and that is why people have found that these fines are relatively cheap in the market. Okay? So, we need a melting facility, small scale melting facility, not with much capital investment, which can accommodate uh, the DRI fines and it is induction furnace, uh, says, which can very um, elegantly do that and that is why people have found that well, making of steel through induction furnace is going to be relatively cheaper rather than you know, setting up a EAF and trying to do the same thing. So, we have mini blast furnaces here as well as large scale blast furnaces. We have induction furnace melting facilities. These are of course, they all have electric arc furnace facilities. There are many such small, small players who have, uh, you know, induction uh, furnace uh, facilities. Now, we will talk about a little bit about uh, the layout of the plant. Now, although these are integrated, let me first talk about uh, the integrated steel, steel, steel making units, that although they are basically Mm. Uh, they make liquid metal, uh, pig iron and process pig iron through steel making. All of them uses oxygen steel making. Today, nobody talks about Thomas process or Bessemer process. So, but uh, the process route that for is followed by this, this integrated players are uh, drastically uh, different. Uh, for example, if you go to Hospet steel, you find a mini blast furnace. If you go to Ishpat industry, you will find out they do not use traditional um, oxygen steel making process. Uh, we have uh, in Ishpath industries, what they have is a process called Conarc process. It is a twin shell converter plus arcing. So, there are two shells. So, it has a feature of electric arc furnace as well as converter and you know why it is. You have done steel making. So, Conarc process gives you the flexibility to have desulphurization and desphosphorization okay, under uh, you know different conditions and which can be one is a converter when you blow in oxygen and another is the arcing process where you can maintain reducing atmosphere and then you can possibly do the desulphurization as well. SR steel has a huge electric arc furnace also. JSW for example, they have Corex, Corex you may have done in iron making that corex process, uh, the largest corex furnace is in the JS, JSW, which is producing more than a million tons of steel uh, per annum. Uh, this is a direct smelting reduction process, if you know, this is the only plant in, the, in India which has uh, facilities. So, ISPATH has a conarc process, corex does not, JSW has both blast furnaces as well as corex, 
we also know that Corex process produces you know high calorific gas value uh, okay, which can be converted into power also. So, if you go to a SR steel, you find they have a huge electric furnace facility. By the way, SR has the largest, biggest uh, DRI is 3.6 million tons per annum. That is their rated capacity of the DRI facility uh, you know, with the SR group. So, they make briquettes and uh, they produce, uh, they charge it into the furnace, the electric arc furnace. They have a little bit bigger size electric arc furnace, I think uh, more than 100 ton size and there they produce the steel. So, it is not the same Tata steel conventional LD process, big blast furnaces 6 or 7 in number uh, and they have secondary steel making, they have both slab casting as well as billet casting facilities. So, that means they produce long products as well as uh, flat products. If you go to JSPL, they have both electric arc furnace as well as uh, liquid metal production units like uh, uh, blast furnaces. Uh, they have also bloom casting, near net shape casting as well as flap casting facilities. Uh, so, they produce both flat products as well as uh, long products. JSW at Turangulu is a flat product plant. They do not have billet or bloom casting, they produce slabs. Uh, there again the hot metal is produced through corex as well as blast furnace and then uh, we have uh, steel making which is done through LD steel making. Jindal stainless is an old uh, it is not an actually integrated steel plant. So, I should have got it here. This is an alloy steel plant, they produce make stainless steel and they have electric arc furnace uh, where stainless steel is going to be go, is, is produced. They also have slab casting uh, facilities, continuous slab casting facilities. All these plants have actually uh, SR steel, uh, I have already, already mentioned electric arc furnace based, slab casters, flat product mill, Ispath also, Ispath has for example, is only plant uh, which has uh, thin slab casting and I think uh, Bhushan or Adhunik also uh, in their east coast, the Odisha plant also have the thin ca slab casting. I think Adhunik group have thin slab casting facility in their Raukela works. So, Konark process, Ispath has Konark process. So, they, 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 they have their, they have a big DI production facility also in Dolvi uh, and uh, this DRI is used in the uh, converter corner process a part of it. They have also blast furnaces there and they use lot of secondary steel making tank degassing. They have converter size for example, you have, we are talking about 185 tons, you are talking about 130 tons, you are talking about 100 tons, you are talking about I think 120 tons and so on. If you go to Bukharu steel plant for example, 320 ton, if you go to Raudkella the converter sizes are 100 tons. So, each plant actually is different, there is no comparison uh, between one plant with uh, the other in terms of their capacity, in terms of their steel making circuitry, in terms of their product, in terms of their efficiency, in terms of their uh, environmental friendliness, I think all these uh, are different from one plant to another plant. So far as uh, the secondary producers are concerned, they are basically electric arc furnace based company, companies, whatever I have listed there, I have not listed those which uses induction furnace. So, I would say that most of them uses uh, electric arc furnace coupled with lot of secondary steel making and continuous casting and KCCL for example, they produce continuously cast slabs. On the other hand, if you go JSSL, this produces stainless steel slabs and Mukon steel, for example, they produces uh, blooms and billets. So, again you see uh, most of the small scale plants are actually long product uh, plants, okay. but one or two of them you know, like KCCL, KCSSL and JSSSL, Jindal, Jindal stainless steel, these are the flat products. And most of them are based on electric arc furnace, that means most of them buy DRI from outside. Okay. For example, Moscow gets their entire feed of DRI from Ispat. Ispat is located in Dolvi. Moscow is located in Khopoli. They are close by in the near in the vicinity of the Raiga district, just on the outskirt of Bombay. Similarly, if you go to, uh, for example, uh, Hospet Steel. Hospet also has 
uh, you know by some uh, DRI from some sources. They also these plants also buy scraps from the market and they have huge scrap uh, storage facility because it is the scrap mixed with the DRIs uh, you know that constitute the principal iron bearing feed to the forest. 